All right, and welcome once again to the White Lotus of Light conversational series. And I am borderline ecstatic, fanboying out for uh, my guest here, Walter Bosley. Um, just uh, one of one of my very favorite um, researchers into alternative history and how that mixes with the esoteric and the hidden, um, dare I say, certain conspiratorial forces, but also just a lot of history that's been overlooked. Um, Walter has, oh, my, my biography for Walter disappeared when I minimized it. Walter has worked in uh, the national security uh, apparatus of the United States for 20 years. He's no longer working that. He was a member of FBI. Uh, he, he worked in FBI and counterintelligence as a contractor. Is that right, Walter? You didn't work directly for them? No, I, I, I was a credentialed full employee of the FBI. I was a, I was a counterintelligence specialist. Okay, so Walter was a counterintelligence specialist. He also worked um, in intelligence at the OSI for the Air Force, and he is a published author. And in 2002, he started his own uh, publishing house where he has uh, several amazing book series, um, including a book that we're going to be focusing on today, which is Origin, the 19th Century Emergence of the 20th Century Breakaway Civilizations. And I highly recommend this book to anyone who watches this uh, show and wants to go a little bit deeper. He also has his Empire of the Wheel trilogy, which is an investigative report into a very strange series of serial murders in California. And was it the early 1900s? Is that correct? 1915 is when the whole ministry starts. Okay. And that's a very fascinating, very interesting thing that would be uh, worthy of its own show as well. And then his um, Secret Mission series, which he just put out uh, book number five in that series, which is all about various historical figures who were um, doing various different sort of cover story uh, missions to various places that Walter has found evidence that they were looking for uh, ancient technology and lost civilizations, uh, particularly in South America, among other places, at least that was the book that I uh, heard an interview Walter did about that. Walter is also just an absolutely stellar researcher. Um, and his family, you have uh, uh, an intelligence background in your family. Isn't that correct? That there's other members of your family, your grandfather or father? Was uh, my, my uncle, an uncle of mine, one of my mom's brothers, who was my mentor, um, professional mentor. He was in the intelligence uh, community for, uh, boy, about 44 years when he retired. And my wow. Dad had been in um, uh, Air Force classified work um, in the 50s, in the late 50s, involved with the early days of the space program. Uh, wow. Pre-NASA. Wow. So, And so today um, I'm going to be talking with Walter primarily about um, his book, as I said, Origin, the 19th Century Emergence of the 20th Century Breakaway Civilizations. And so... I have been fascinated since I was a child, like many of us with UFOs. I refuse to use the new word, the UAP, which is what it's being called nowadays in Congress and the halls of uh, Langley, Virginia, CIA, and other uh, places where people uh, like to obfuscate and spin yarns rather than provide facts to the public. But I've always been interested in the UFO phenomenon. I'm someone who believes that there's multiple sources that account for it. Um, but the reason that I really love Walter's work is he has traced um, what some people call, and again, I, I hesitate to use this word for reasons we'll go into later, but the secret space program, or I've even started using the term the clandestine space program to move away from the sort of junk conspiracy theory that's out there, which is unfortunate because Walter and Joseph Farrell and Daniel Liz and Michael Schratt and... Um, uh, Paul Levia, Leviolette, uh. <laughs> Paul Leviolette, is that how you say his name? Yeah, Paul Leviolette yeah. and John Brandenburg. And John Brandenburg and some of these excellent researchers uh, were using the term secret space program first, actually, to talk about this phenomenon of what appears to be. And there's a lot of evidence that points towards this. It's kind of like you have the outside of a jigsaw puzzle and we're missing the interior piece, but you begin to see a shape and that shape seems to show that there were uh, at least one parallel space program within uh, the United States. We now have a document that points to that, something called Blue Gemini, is I believe the name of uh, what it was called, that came out with um, 
um, the former Secretary of Defense uh, McNamara uh, mentioned it in a memo to Kennedy that he wondered why there was two space programs, why there was NASA and something that he referred to as, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Walter, Blue Gemini. Is that accurate? Do you know the document I'm talking about? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, really? I, I have not heard of that. Is this a recent release? Or It's a fairly recent release, past five years or so. Daniel Lizd has talked about it extensively. Okay, uh, I've, he, I've been off the research on that particular subject because I've been working so hard on my secret mission series. So I've got to catch up with this document because that could be the smoking gun on this. To me, it kind of is. And that was what Daniel Liz, a uh, dark journalist who um, a huge fan of his show, absolutely fantastic. I might have even seen Walter initially uh, uh, being interviewed by Daniel Liz. And if viewers, if you haven't checked out Dark Journalists, you're in for a treat. Yeah. Uh, Daniel does amazing work. And he was one of the main organizers of um, some of these uh, secret space program conferences. And I want to real quick, just take a quick aside. We're not going to go into this too sure. deep. That term has been sort of captured by what appears to be uh, a sort of media and possibly even counterintelligence push by certain groups who either are just trying to feather their own nest by making money off the UFO phenomenon, or who are perhaps there's some indications that they might be uh, uh, doing so at the behest of certain powerful actors who don't want us discussing the UFO phenomenon, in particular this uh, clandestine space program uh, right. with any kind of uh, facts to base it up. And they like to talk about things like blue chickens and uh, <laughs> time travel and all this kind of stuff. And some of those things may very well exist. I'm, I'm very open-minded, but I tend to be more of a Pyrrhic skeptic. I want to see some information to go on. And that's why I love Walter's work because what Walter has done along with some of the other uh, people whose names I mentioned is they've sort of reverse engineered, so to speak, <laughs> uh, this, this line of technology that goes back to, in Walter's case, he was able to trace it back to um, the uh, 19th century even mm -hmm. uh, with something called the Sonora Aero Club. And we're gonna go ahead and sort of start there. And so Walter, can you sort of explain your thesis of why, you know, a lot of people talk about the Nazis and the technology and in particular for those who are more familiar, Die Glocke or the Bell, which we'll touch on later. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of people just think that that technology came there or maybe it was channeled by the Vril Society or maybe it was, uh, you know, aliens came down to help uh, the Nazis and the Nazis did one of them did say that they had help, but they didn't really explain that. I'm more inclined to believe it was help from a secret society of some sort that had access to the exact kind of information that Walter's going to talk about. But Walter, please uh, tell us about uh, Delshaw and the Sonora Aero Club. Well, th um, that's what folks should understand from the beginning on this discussion is we have mm -hmm. one source. Um, mm, yes. on the Sonora Aero Club and the mysterious group called NIMSA. Mm -hmm. And that is Charles Delshaw. Now, Delshaw started in 1893 uh, putting together these several of these volumes, you know, uh, these amazing books of his artwork and his journals uh, depicting and telling the story of this group, the Sonora Aero Club, in Northern California, Tuolumne County, right there next to where Yosemite National Park is. Um, the story of how this group was dabbling in successfully um, flight, controlled flight, specifically what we popularly would call anti-gravity type technology today. These weren't just hot air balloons and they weren't just early airplanes. And um, Del Shell died in 1923, um, uh, you know, a decade or more before we suspect Nazi Germany was beginning to develop what's called the Bell. Now, the issue with Del Shell that um, all researchers have to acknowledge, you know, who cite him is that, yes, there, if you look up Del Shell, um, he's generally just written off as what they call an insider artist. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, at, at this point with the, the research and my position is I vehemently disagree with, he's just an insider artist and it was all in his head. Um, because if nothing else, we have 
the 1890s airship ministry, and we have this suspicious thing called de Glocka or the bell um, and other things pointing to that. If it weren't for these other things, you might be able to write off Del Shao, but, but that's the problem because of these other things you can't. And what I um, did, my contribution to perpetuating, you know, what Del Shao was trying to get across is that um, I see a thread between what this, and I'll elaborate a little further into the group and stuff, but what this group of Germans, they were German immigrants in California, what they were fooling with, according to Del Shao, and how that uh, uh, resonates, for lack of a better word, with the 1893, or the 18, I'm sorry, the 1896, 1897 um, airship mystery, the famous airship mystery, uh, and then how that continued to resonate with the, uh, the, the lore of the suspected Nazi bell. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, that thread, the primary thread is the German thread, because Delschau, right. a German immigrant himself, tells the story of uh, being sent to California, to the United States, to go to California at um, the behest of, under the employment of this mysterious German-based group that he called NIMSA. And mm -hmm. they were, again, this, he didn't elaborate on them other than that they were German-based. And they were the um, kind of the, the, the parent group or, or under their ages, according to Delschau, these various little groups, um, a few in the United States, Sonor Air Club in, included, were these individuals developing these weird exotic technologies. Sonora Aero Club was working on flight. And uh, in, in their case, they were German immigrants, a few Italian immigrants. And Del Shao was sent as a young man to California to observe and report on them. Well, he ends up going there and he, he ends up liking these guys. <laughs> it's like, you know, mm -hmm. he, he really likes what they're developing and um, uh, uh, befriends them. And the parent group, NIMSA, um, again, in Del Shell's writings, he talks about how they send a representative who the Sonora Club didn't like. There was some differences of opinion. Uh, the, you know, the, the German headquarters of NIMSA wanted these groups to develop this technology for military purposes. And the, at least in the case of the Sonora Aero Club, uh, they didn't want to. They didn't want it applied to military technology. And they, they, they didn't really, let's say they didn't care for the representative from their home country. They, they liked being in, you got to understand, California in the mid-19th century, you know, that, that the very epitome of, you know, one of the Wild West zones. Because you could, right. I, I mean, even in the 1920s, the reason the New York uh, theater owners who got into the created the film industry, the reason they came even in the 1920s, 70 years later to California is because California at that time and for quite a while was known to be away from the purview, you know, of uh, those in charge or, or the grownups or whatever. So these guys <laughs> in the 1850s, even, you know, before California became a state, they're enjoying this autonomy and this freedom to, to really do what they want. And um, uh, they also took advantage of the fact that um, California is so far away from the prying cities of the East, eyes in the cities in the East, that um, it was the perfect place to uh, really develop and test their exotic technology um, mm -hmm. in, in private, in secret. Uh, they, they would do this even away from the small towns of um, Columbia and uh, Jamestown, the little towns in what's called California's gold country, the mm -hmm. towns of uh, Tuolumne County, they would, uh, according to Del Shaw, fly these things, um, really proof of concept kind of little craft, and uh, th they would build them and test some of them, and according to Del Shaw, fly them successfully out in the hills away from the towns. So they really liked working in secret. They were very secretive about how this worked, what their technology was. Their leader was a guy named Peter Menace, uh, mm -hmm. himself again a German immigrant and um, he was the only one that knew the uh, uh, recipe so to speak for the um, I, I wouldn't call it a fuel but it was a necessary element to the process of how 
their technology, their engine worked. And uh, subsequent research that I have done um, shows that it very likely was what is known in history books as the Rankin turbine. And uh, mm -hmm. Rankin, I'm really terrible on pronouncing his first name, but mm -hmm. uh, he was the partner of uh, the, the, the one of the, the, the famous founder of uh, the study of thermodynamics. And in 1849, mm -hmm. Rankin published his basic schematic and design for a turbine, mm -hmm. turbine engine. And um, it is just remarkably near identical to the schematic that Delshaw mm -hmm. uh, uh, depicted in his books sometime between 1893 and 1923 as the, the uh, schematic of the motor, the engine, right? The propulsion mm -hmm. device um, of these flying machines of the 1850s. Uh, so, it, you know, this is the it, turbine that Walter's referring to. here. Yes, there it is. There's the Rankin turbine. And when you look at Del Shaw's illustrations, which I show in my books and, and you can find um, it, it's virtually identical. It's essentially a Rankin turbine that you turbine that you see here. Mm -hmm. And what Peter Menace did was he used this um, this secret sauce, if, if you will, <laughs> that he called the soup. And it was a green mm -hmm. color. And that was the liquid that he ran through this turbine. And uh, according to Del Shaw, it was that secret ingredient that uh, it run through the turbine that created the, uh, the, the anti-gravity result, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, Menace, we are told, died in an accident, a, a flight test accident. There was an explosion and we're told that he died. I, I, you know, it's possible that, you know, being fed up with NIMSA and uh, that he decided to just kind of check out, and, you know, possibly fake his death, change his identity. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, he, he leaves the story um, at that point that we're told that uh, he died and he takes the secret of the soup mm -hmm. with him. And um, what I did was I picked, I tried to pick up from there mm -hmm. because what I saw was the, the 1893 airship mystery, um, the technologies that are described by the witnesses in that just seem to really resonate with the things that the Sonora Aero Club was doing 40 years prior. And then on top of that, um, in the, uh, 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 the, the literature and the lore and, and the details about um, Daglaka, mm -hmm. the Nazi bell, um, what I found connecting Delshaw possibly to that was in Delshaw's books, he has uh, two drawings of this essential operative device that was developed by the Sonora Aero Club, and it is identical. There it is. It's identical in, in basic concept to the Nazi bell. And there it is. That's Del Shell's drawing. Right and, and, and just for viewers who don't know, because because Walter and I are kind of like nerdy about this particular <laughs> subject, obviously. Um, yeah. There is, oops, let's see here. I got to go back. Um, do you already seen the bell there, Walter? Yes. Okay, so this is the, the Nazi bell for, for viewers who don't know. And there was a, um, a Polish, uh, he, was, he was sort of like an amateur historian, World War II historian. And at the end of uh, when the Cold War, and the Cold War ended and like the Berlin Wall fell and Poland became independent again yeah. uh, and no longer part of the USSR, he decided to go in the archives and he was just kind of you know, uh, a war history buff, and he was just going through it, and he uh, stumbled upon or decided to look at these um, trials of some of these SS officers at the end of the war, and he came across some really mind-boggling stuff to where, among many very interesting things, these um, high-ranking SS officers who had actually been stationed in, I believe it was in the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. uh, were at a research facility that was run by 
Oh gosh, one of the the the, the real head of the SS. Everyone thinks that um, uh, Himmler was the head of the SS, but Martin Bormann had sort of created an apparatus of guys directly underneath all the high command guys that answered to him. A I, parallel. I just remember, yeah, I please. Just, I just want to throw in there for the viewer's sake. This, of course, mm -hmm. is an artistic depiction yes. of the bell. Um, it's a little dramatic that the artist yes. you know, put the red stripe with the swastika on. <laughs> right, right. I, I personally... <laughs> I haven't been able to find, I couldn't at the time that I have used this as an example, I couldn't find the name of the artist who did this, but if anyone knows, you know, please. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's used all over the internet and I too exactly. would like to credit the artist. Um, but, but it I, has the basic, sure. the, the basic description that some of the um, information gives the shape and the things, you know, except for the swastika part. Yeah. Right. And so, um, Th this uh, SS officer who was um, answering to, gosh, I can't remember his name right off the top of my head, um, a very important uh, SS officer who uh, a lot of researchers have found this parallel command structure within yes. the Third Reich that Martin Bormann, uh, Hitler's personal uh, secretary, it seems that Martin Bormann took over um, when... Um, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name who went to uh, he went to England there in that ship and they got taken out. Uh, Rudolf Hess. When Rudolf when Hess yeah. Hess had kind of been uh, Hitler's second in command or major mm -hmm. confidant, and then uh, he went over. He got arrested from by the British when he went over there trying to broker some kind of deal. He went there personally, which is very strange. There's a lot of weird stuff about Rudolf Hess, and that's its own show. Let me tell you. Uh, Dr. Fer Joseph Farrell uh, has done an, <laughs> an entire book on Rudolf Hess because it's so weird. Um, but whatever happened, R Rudolf Hess was now out of the picture and this man named Martin Bormann came in and became Hitler's primary confidant. And there's a lot of evidence that he basically did an internal coup uh, and, and created his own parallel command structure within the Nazi party and regime that was incredibly, uh, Martin Bormann was uh, profoundly evil, in my opinion, but he was an absolute organizational genius, almost beyond imagination, almost beyond yeah. imagination. And he created this entire parallel structure to where all the people people think about, like Himmler and um, trying to think of the head of the, um, the head of the, the, the one guy who actually was alive to stand trial. Uh, I can't think of him right now, but, but there's Gehring. Gehring, yeah. yeah Gehring, yeah. it's so like, he, he had a guy under Himmler that answered to him, which is the guy whose name I'm trying to think of. He had, um, you know, a guy under Gearing, which act, a, answered directly to Bormann. He had a guy, um, you know, within the propaganda ministry. All the high command had another little personal secretary kind of guy, just like Martin Bormann, and they all answered to him. And these were the guys who actually got shit done. And so... If you look, actually, once Martin Bormann appears on the scene, all of a sudden the Nazi machine becomes just really efficient, in my yeah. opinion. Like it becomes extremely well organized and things are going very well. Although, of course, near the end of the war, Martin Bormann realized that things were uh, that the Nazis were going to lose. And he started moving all this money out. And again, Dr. Joseph Farrell, um, who is a national treasure, in my opinion, has done all sorts of research on this, as have others. And the point is, is that this. This uh, SS officer there in the Czech Republic, he uh, was answering to that even higher ranking SS guy. And he talked about this thing called Deglaka, which was this bell image that I was showing you. And he said that basically, if you put a ton of energy into this, it required enough energy almost to po power a small city in the, in the 1940s, which isn't anything compared to modern, but still it's a tremendous amount of electricity. This thing would hover off the ground and put off all kinds of radiation. There also was a discussion that inside this device was two counter-rotating fields of some sort of mercury plasma. Um, and that something about that counter-rotation, rotation seems to come up constantly in all this uh, UFO milieu or uh, free energy. Or right, it, it was two, yeah. two counter-rotating cylinders with the plasma in between them. The plasma was pumped oh. in between the counter-rotating cylinders, and it was the counter-rotation uh, uh, plus the presence of that plasma in there, that what it, that serum, whatever it was, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that has been called red mercury, has been described as kind of, or uh, a reddish color, 
which mm-hmm. led to my personal uh, uh, hypothesis or wondering, I might not be the first guy that's thought of this, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this leads into, you know, what we talked about before starting. If, if you know, I've wondered if Peter Menace in the 1850s, the secret ingredient he used was the green liquid um, that he called soup. I've wondered if maybe what soup the soup was was some type of liquid emerald or some type of emerald fine emerald dust in some type of liquid so therefore was the red serum liquid ruby or or some type of you know you could make synthetic rubies and then uh put the powder in some type of you know mercury serum or or whatever um and and we know from later from reading in the gemstone file the the infamous book about the jfk assassination milieu that you know synthet the production of synthetic rubies i believe are discussed in in that book and so we know that that this uh, uh reported existence of synthetic rubies being developed um you know in the post-war era to me to my mind could suggest the possibility that the secret to the red mercury wasn't so much that it was mercury it could have been you know mercury infused with liquid rubies um, mm. it's mm-hmm. you know it's a thought and what's it what's interesting about peter menace possibly you know hypothetically using some type of liquefied emeralds is that you know we we get i i, I think the primary source of emeralds or at least a, a huge source of emeralds is south america right and we know that there's been serious German presence and exploration and mining. You know, primarily it started with you know a lot of mining after the archaeological uh, researchers and explorers went there um, uh, of, of of German mining and in, in, in you know the presence of uh, Germans there. And you know, is this where Peter Menes, you know, possibly learned about these um, hidden exotic? Uh, uh, properties of say you know and figured out and developed liquefied emerald or did he learn about this from old sources and you know did did nimza because they never got you know peter menace to cooperate with them did did they somehow learn the same thing and did they by the time we get in the 20th century learn how to apply a liquefied you know liquefied rubies be they synthetic or natural i it's it's a question that i ask um Mm. You know, could that be? That's interesting, and and um, I I really like that hypothesis about emeralds in particular in a South American connection because um, uh, one of the things that that uh, Walter talks about in his secret mission series is how there were these uh, various explorers or people who were supposedly doing rather mundane things, but there's evidence that they were going down to. Um, among other places, South America to look for some of these uh, rumored ruins. Some of the early explorers talked about seeing vast cities inside the Amazon, for example. And of course, some people were looking for El Dorado and gold. That's more during the uh, conquistador era. But nonetheless, this this repeated idea of uh, ancient missing civilizations in South America comes up again and again and again. And I actually, are you uh, familiar with Freddie Silva's work on some of the stuff on South America? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. He 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 does really interesting stuff, and there there's just a lot of evidence. Um, I mean, there's actually way more ruins in South America with. Um, uh, that are especially megalithic in nature, meaning massive, massive stones that are uh, very difficult to uh, sort of explain away, like how, how they had such large stones. I mean, some people say it's some form of ancient poured concrete, and that might be. Uh, that is also, um, you know, a pretty amazing technological achievement, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But um, there's one in, uh, I want to say it's a Cusco, uh, Cusco. where they have, yes. yeah, Cusco, where they have this gigantic wall with some of the stones uh, have got away 15 tons or something yeah. like that. And they're uh-huh. cut perfectly. And there's it, literally, you couldn't slide a razor blade between the have, stones. They're so Have tight. you had the opportunity to go down there yet? I have not. I want to go to South America. You, you, I, I, I strongly recommend it. I, yeah. I worked in, um, I've worked in Bogota, Colombia, 
mm-hmm. on three occasions for a month at a time. I spent mm-hmm. a few months down in, in Colombia. But um, during that time, this is going back a few years, 2003, mm-hmm. I took um, three weeks and I went, um, you know, David Hatcher Childress, he, mm-hmm. he um, guides or, or hosts or whatever, he offers uh, guided tours of these places. I've done mm-hmm. two uh, trips through the uh, Mayan ruins of central Mexico with David's group and mm-hmm. uh, the South America trip. And I highly recommend this to anyone interested in this stuff because he takes you to all these places. You go to Cusco, you go to Saskawayman, I think is what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. And you go to Machu Picchu and all on t- and all these places. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, it just, it, it really emphasizes um these things we're talking about and and what you read about when you're standing there looking at it. I had never heard of Puma Punku at all in 2003. Yeah. Until I went on, I was on that trip and David takes us there. And, you know, my first sight before he says anything about what's believed and what the lore is, you know, he says, what do you guys think of this? And I'm looking at this and to my eye, of course, the, you know, the 20th Mm -hmm. going into the 21st century, I, I'm looking at this and I'm going, that was machined you know these yeah. holes and it just it looks machined mm-hmm. and um you know and then he explains what the suspected history and what the alleged you know reported history is but um yeah i really i really recommend it when you as soon as you get a chance as soon as it works go on one of those trips um because it's just fascinating and, I'll have to ask you afterwards because um, David Childress is friends with a friend of mine, and I wonder if you know her. But we'll, we'll go into that when we okay. when we're off camera sure, sure. act- afterwards. Yeah. Um, so, getting back to um, this these nineteenth century origins, one of the things I think is interesting, and, and one of the reasons that I, I said that mercury plasma, which is speculative, by the way, in terms yes. of Dupaca, we have Absolutely. very very limited information, basically based on Igor Watowski's work. Um, I, I think it's called. Um, something, something in the Wunderwaff, Wunderwaffen. So it's like Wunderwaffen. wonder weapons yeah. of that the um, Nazis are making. And there's some really weird and interesting stuff that doesn't really touch in this whole anti-gravity thing. Just really, they were working all kinds of crazy stuff that's just really, really fascinating. And that's just a really interesting book. And Igor Watowski, I don't, it's not like I know the man, but I've seen him interviewed a number of times. He doesn't strike me as someone who exaggerates no, or who no. is interested in fame right if anything he uh he seems pretty nerdy and humble and just like someone who's willing to go through ancient archives and read it carefully and like i'm not even sure that i would have the patience for that he just doesn't strike me as someone who exaggerates at all and i mean and he can source the documents for it now of course when he comes out with this book at first nobody paid attention and then as more people like walter and others started be talking about it out came the debunker crews. Oh no, he's misunderstanding. Oh, it's an exaggeration. Well, oh, I think blah, the blah, first blah. the first mention of it in an English uh, book, English language book, um, is Nick Cook's Hunt for Zero Point, uh, and he has a a pretty decent little bit where he talks about it. And then, if I'm not mistaken, I think Joseph Farrell was mm-hmm. the next person after Nick Cook to really jump into digging into you know the bell story and mm-hmm. um and and uh, unfortunately for instance the, this the, the, this issue this lore the story of de glock of the bell um people see that as uh, a verifier of the hanabu saucer myth the pro as as fun and thrilling and as exciting as the idea of a nazi flying saucer unfortunately um all of the evidence is questionable and its source is lacks credibility and it it only emerged all of the evidence only emerged in the post-war um kind of neo-nazi milieu and it's just it it i'm of the opinion i'm in that camp that when you look close and you do the analysis, that's why I'm of this opinion. The Hanabu thing is complete myth. It's complete mm-hmm. nonsense. But because the bell was reported to have anti-gravity uh, uh, function and, and properties, a lot of people point to that and say, oh, yeah, that, that that's entirely corroborates the, the, the Hanabu, the fly, Nazi flying saucer. And no, <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't. But... Um, 
you can't, I don't believe in throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Right. I'm a great believer in the, the nugget of truth theory that, you know, right. and, and just because I think the Hanabu isn't true, mm-hmm. I definitely think there's something to the bell. You, know, mm-hmm. you, yeah, don't, you yeah. don't have to think that it was a it built as a flying machine or an attempt to make a flying saucer to accept that they were fooling around with something that could mm-hmm. have resulted in, you know, tapping into what we call, for lack of a better term, anti-gravity. Yeah, that's it, it's it's interesting, too, because th- that that description of the counter rotating drums and then a plasma that. I thought it was described as a mercury plasma, although we don't really know. I mean, because right. uh, one, of, one of the things about this is that that the SS officer um, that Igor Watoski refers to in this whole trial, he says that, um, gosh, and it's driving me nuts that I can't, is it Hans Kommler? Hans Kommler, yes. Kommler, thank you. Finally, yeah. it came to me. Oh, it's been driving me crazy. The, the, so, the guy who I believe uh, mysteriously died four times? Is that- <laughs> yeah, something like that. Him and Borman uh, died more than once, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Before the James Bond die another day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of thing came out. But yeah, so um, Hans Kommler was the, um, the, the kind of true but secret head of the SS that reported to uh-huh. uh, Borman. And according to the Nazi o- uh, officer who was um, being tried by the uh, Russians uh, in Poland, he said that uh, Kommler basically killed almost all the scientists except for a tiny handful who were working on it. And a lot of actually even fellow SS and lots of like Czech people who were being used as slaves mm-hmm. and just like he went in and killed all these people and removed all this stuff out uh, before the Russians could get there as the Eastern Front was trying to collapse for the Nazis. And there's rumors that this, that de Glocka and that there may have been like an additional prototype was moved out. And it does seem that this is um, like they found some additional way of uh, doing the same technology that Walter's talking about in the 1800s and the 19th century. Um, and that the big difference being that they had access to electricity, which could allow them to then have access to plasma. And what's interesting is that um, the Nazis were working a lot, or Germans actually, even before the Nazis came along, were working a lot on plasma physics uh, in the 20s and 30s. And mm-hmm. then that just boop, goes silent. And uh, it's just like after the war, as Walter will tell you, um, tell them, tell them, Walter, about the uh, 1950s and, and into the very early 60s, um, U.S. and anti-gravity. I mean, because that was out in the open, actually. Yeah. And, and there's there's other more uh, technical, technically savvy uh, researchers that uh, c- can tell it even better. But essentially, just like you said, the plasma research of Nazi Germany kind of disappeared by the time we get to the war. Um, in Through the 1950s, into the late 1950s, I think 1958 is the curiously the interesting cutoff because there's some other interesting things going on in 1958. But by 1958, there had been through the 50s articles in popular science and in you know publications like that uh you know in in public sources magazines there had been all sorts of articles on anti-gravity research literal anti-gravity research and something happened by 1958 that it disappeared from being talked about publicly and it appears that a lid was put on any discussion of anti-gravity research. So what does that suggest? Obviously, it suggests that there was a breakthrough of some sort. And what's interesting about that is by, what is it, 1965, we have the Kecksburg, uh, yeah, UFO, which looked like the bell and right. it like, gonna, you know, with anti-gravity, that. acted like the bell. And at that time, we had had our... Operation Paperclip scientists for 20 years, <laughs> our Germans, yeah. our Operation Paperclip Germans for 20 years, some of whom likely knew mm-hmm. how to, um, likely understood what their colleagues who had been, you know, mysteriously assassinated uh, were and, doing with the bell or may themselves even have somehow been involved with the bell and survived Kamler's, um, you know, uh, it, uh, 
on his purge. <laughs> yeah, his purge. Um, it, and it, if you look at these three, it's wild because like here, yeah. here's the description that Del Shaw has that no later than the 19, what, 1923 was when 19, he died. So it, it, yeah, he, later had, he had to have drawn his bell uh, device uh, before 19 before or by 1923 when he died and and it, I, I i believe it's in a part of the book that's years before 1923 so right. um you know if here's the thing if the whole thing about the bell if you know wakowski stumbled upon a great big hoax that mm -hmm. hoax here, here's the funny thing del shall it would have had to have been a a post-war hoax because del shall uh uh does his bell drawing before 1923 uh there's reason to believe and or suspect that nazi germany was developing de glocka the bell during the 1940s but del Schau's works are essentially laying hidden and not discovered until 1971 and really don't become uh public anywhere until after that and that's in small museums for essentially Del Shao didn't hit, um, uh, I don't want to say widespread, but really didn't hit uh, uh, the, the consciousness of our community, our alternative mm -hmm. research and ufology community, I believe until like maybe the, the 1990s, definitely not until the early 2000s. So um, if, if the bell and subsequent things are all a great big hoax, and you can point to Del Shao's rudimentary uh, concept of the bell. That, that would have had to have been pulled off by somebody who was very familiar with Del Shao's stuff going into the 1990s. Because mm -hmm. Igor Wachowski, you know, he was talking to sources and learning about this, you know, in the 90s. Um, right. there's, all, there's also the issue of what did Dean Koontz learn and when did he learn it? Because in the Dean, Kuntz, and I do a video of this on my Walter Bosley channel at YouTube. I did it last summer. You can scroll down and look for it. It's my discussion on, you know, the Nazi bell. Um, Dean Koontz, the author, mm -hmm. uh, came out with a book in the late 80s titled Lightning. Yeah. Yeah, and I know there, exactly what you're talking about. There is a device that is now it's horizontal it's not vertical but it's two counter rotating cylinders and it causes and it opens a portal so it works as a time machine okay yeah. and that book had been written and published including in europe before igor wikowski learned from the source in polish intelligence or czech one of the eastern european intelligence services about the alleged Nazi bell. And mm -hmm. that's the unfortunate thing, you know, that we have to consider is, did that intelligence officer read the Kuntz book and fabricate, you know, well, this story to tell Wachowski? We do have to ask ourselves that. We have to consider that. But equally fascinating, has anyone ever asked Dean Kuntz I'm thinking I should do, you know, any one of yeah. us should do that. Has any, did anyone ever ask Dean Koontz where he got the idea for the device in lightning? You know, was it his original idea or did he hear about something? And then you have to wonder, well, how did he hear about this? Because we learned about it from, you know, we can trace it back through Joseph Farrell, Nick Cook, and then Igor Wachowski before him. Igor Wachowski mm -hmm. being credited as the first author to write about the bell as such publicly. But there's the Dean Koontz novel. So you, you do have to wonder, you know, what's going on there with He that. also has a, a book, and I'm not going to get into this, but viewers look up... Uh... Look up that there's a, a, a book about a, a, a virus and it comes out of uh, yeah. Wuhan, China, no less. <laughs> yeah, you got to worry about Kind of specific. But, but um, here's the I, thing. In, in defense of Igor and all of us who think the bell might be real, remember, Kecksburg right. predates the uh, Koontz novel by 20 years. Yeah, and here's the... Um, let, me, let me share the screen. Here's the... Um, Here's the, the Kecksburg, sometimes called the Kecksburg acorn, but it's eerily yeah. similar to the description of the, of the Nazi bell yeah. in, in terms of its shape. And also, um, 
It has these weird little hieroglyphics on the bottom. Yes. They said uh, people who saw it because it, it got picked up by uh, the military came in and picked it up and it was uh, thrown on the back of a, a big military truck and then and carted off. But people, uh, eyewitnesses who saw it said there were some kind of like runes or um, or hieroglyphics or something along like on the outside around the a ring in the bottom. One thing I was going to say earlier about one of the reasons I said uh, mercury plasma, and, and it is speculative, is that there, there is this counter rotation, there's um, some kind of plasma, and it seems like, um, it, it sounds eerily similar to me of the Vimanas, which at the center of those, there was a mercury vortex engine, is, the, is my understanding that there was a the description of what was at the center. Is that accurate, Walter? I see you raising that. Well, it, 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 here, and here's the issue, and, and again, mm -hmm. In the interest, I like to be honest about these. Oh, things. please. And, absolutely. and I am in my books and stuff. If the issue with the Vimana is this in a basic description, yes, in the ancient texts, we learn about these flying machines, these Vimanas mm -hmm. and such. But the popular discussion these days is actually based on a book that did not emerge until 1908 in Sanskrit written in 1908 and, and um, then translated into English for the first time, if I'm not mistaken, 1954. And that's the book that often by proponents of the Vimana uh, lore or discussion, let's say, because I think there's something to it. Um, mm -hmm. That's the book that is mistakenly referred to as an ancient text when actually, no, it dates back to 1908. Now, some if somebody says, well, hey, that's where Delshaw, you know, he fabricated all this and that's where he got the idea. The problem is we're not aware that Charles Delshaw could read or understand Sanskrit. So if that Pretty Sanskrit rare. book that came out in 1908 um, wasn't translated to English until 1954 and wasn't disseminated through the Western you know, world until 1954. Delshaw was dead by 1923. So it doesn't look like there's any way Charles Delshaw even heard of that book to be inspired to come up with this, you know, to fake the whole thing about the Sonora Era Club based on that. So that's kind of something that, that, that helps corroborate the Right, the pro Del Shao telling the truth side of the story. Mm -hmm. um, however, that 1908 book, 1908 book that gets referred to, um, you know, it it refers to um, uh, it, it, it's an elaboration on what the actual ancient, the Mahabharata and the ancient scriptures say. Um, mm -hmm. it, it it tries in a modern technical, and I say modern, early 20th century, from the modern technical uh, technological perspective, it tries to um, a kind of uh, provide um, not a reverse engineering, but but an engineering understanding of maybe how the ancient Vimanas work. So, yes, there's something to the idea uh, from from ancient exotic technologies that are hinted at to the idea of what we've come to call the Mercury Vortex engine. But that, as such, is a modern thing. And there's also the, I think it's in the Keber Nagas, the, um, the Ethiopian text uh, uh -huh. where they talk about um, either King Solomon himself King Solomon. or they were somehow related to Solomon that they had vehicles that were a capable oh, yeah. of vertical takeoff and landing. Well, the, well, um, some, you know, some folks, scholars have put forth the idea that, it, and, and I, it, it, it might've even been mentioned in the book, the kingdom of Prester John anyway, um, mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, that, Solomon possibly, yeah, had flying machines to go from his kingdom to, you know, Ethiopia and such. So, you know, but there's so much mythology mixed in with all that, that you gotta, you gotta remember to dig for the nugget, you know. Of right. And um, so I'm going to uh, attempt, see, see, Walter and I know, know a lot of this stuff and the kind of way out there stuff and are trying to thread it all together. And so for viewers who perhaps aren't as uh, knowledgeable as Walter and I, like it could be a little bit confusing some of this. So we're going to talk in uh, part two more about like some of this more ancient thread, and I'm going to try and focus on that. And so I'm going to try and bring us back into focus here into the um, uh, 19th century stuff. And so I want to talk a bit, Walter, about so so we have there in the 1840s we have the Sonoro Era Club, and we have Delshaw with these. And I'm just going to show some pictures real quick to the viewer. I didn't want to. Um, 
kind of uh, inter interrupt you there when we were talking uh, at the beginning. And I'll, I'm going to add in some of these uh, after the fact. But here's some of these uh, drawings mm -hmm. of Del Shell. This one in particular is very interesting and looks a bit like a turbine, actually. Yes, um, very much. But so. you, you, you just see that there's th these are clearly some kind of devices, and they're also clearly not hot air balloons, which right. some uh, proponents of that. And some of them, he seems to be focusing on the internal mechanics, which yes. again, there's some turbine looking things. Uh -huh. And so they're almost like a cross section of yeah. the vehicle and others he kind of shows on the outside. And you get a sense that these are very rudimentary. They're, they're not that large. And again, we have what appears almost always, there's some kind of thing at the center that looks like it has some kind of something like a turbine. I couldn't find it. I know the picture Walter's talking about, and I don't have one that um, isn't stealing it from another interviewer. So I, I didn't have the turbine. Well, and notice, add that after the fact. Notice mm -hmm. the, notice the very, the, 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 the common uh, uh, design you see there very often is some type of dome or, or rudimentary mm -hmm. bell shaped kind of thing. But there's something specifically in, in the, Where's what's interesting in the book from 1908 that mm -hmm. shows the the uh, uh, the perspective vimanas of ancient times. Mm -hmm. um, there is this dome shape at the top, like this domed chamber. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is in the Del Shao stuff that you're looking at now, you see the domed chamber. So did mm -hmm. Peter Menison them? Did did they learn something about? exotic technology see there's the dome shape again now that's a cutaway of what looks like a classic flying saucer of the 1940s and 50s right if you yeah you know, that's a cutaway if you were to see that you know what was it round was it you know mm -hmm. there's the dome thing on top and um in my uh, video on my there. channel i i show side by side some of the del shall dome top schematics right next to the uh the 1908 schematics of, of the proposed vimanas Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I find it interesting that there is this commonality. And between what's proposed in the Vimanas and what's proposed by Delshaw, as you can see here, there is that concept always of the rotation, right? The, the right. rotating, the spinning um, of, uh, of the energy of some sort. And there's this dome top, you know, thing, which when you think of the bell, you know, it's, we're told it's bell shaped. There's the rotation, and inside is the rotation and the spinning. So we we are basically, if you step back and look at the big picture, um, we're talking about the same basic technological concept between what Del Shaw said the Sonora Aero Club was doing in the 1850s, what what the 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 1908 Sanskrit book says, first of all, was being done in ancient times at the Vamanas, and then what Del Shell says Sonora Aero Club was doing in the 1850s, and uh, elements of the, the 1890s airship mystery craft, and then, of course, the Nazi bell, um, and possibly, you know, the, the, uh, the so-called Kecksburg UFO. So, uh, you know, if you step back and, and you see, okay, wait a minute, what we're looking at is a progression of the same technological concept. So something fun for you, and then I want to touch on that just for you to look into. I just watched sure. this uh, Daniel Liz interview with Dr. Joseph Farrell, and there's mm -hmm. a reason I keep bringing up Dr. Farrell, by the way, for viewers who don't know him, I hope to have him on the show. And he's a wizard he's a genius he's just like otherworldly both in terms of production and I, I i think he doesn't sleep he just reads and writes and does his show and that's it that's <laughs> he pretty takes much care right. of his dog shiloh and he used to live he used to live only a half hour from my house um for oh really years there and oh yeah i've spent many a night uh he and i you know late into the evening having our conversations and and i can tell you you that's his life right there which yeah you nailed. he's there working at the books um, he's always got four books ahead of time outlined. And when I say outlined, they're thicker than the actual books end up being the outlines. And he, you know, yeah, that's what he does is he, he, other world searches and he writes. <laughs> yeah. And, um, anyways, I hope to have him on some point. I'm a gigantic fan of his, um, yeah. and he, uh, he just, inter he just did an interview with Daniel Liz and Daniel Liz dropped something he hadn't heard of. So I guess there was, um, and this is total an aside, but I just got to tell you this. Um, there was some people supposedly found uh, a Civil War shipment of gold 
that mm-hmm. had been hijacked and it was in Pennsylvania and it was within like 40 or 50 miles of Kecksburg. And they found it with LIDAR, some kind of large uh, amount of metal using mm-hmm. LIDAR. And they, <clears throat> they went to dig it up and don't ask me why they were so dumb. Like, I don't understand why treasure hunters ever talk to the government. Like, what are they thinking? But they talked to, I guess, the FBI and said, hey, we're going to we want to go dig up this uh, this Civil War gold and we need your permission. And the FBI was like, OK, but where is it? And so they told him. And then they went there and there was a hole. It had clearly been excavated. And the FBI was like, no, nah, there's there's nothing there. I don't think I, I, it might have been gold. But Daniel Liz and Dr. Farrell both raised their eyebrows that maybe it was a fragment of the Kecksburg craft that was retrieved because it was just very close. It was within like 30 or 40 miles of the crash site or, or even smaller than that. So anyways, just a little nugget that you can ask uh, Joseph or Daniel next oh, time I will. You have a chance to talk to him because that one really caught my ear and since we're talking about Kecksburg. So getting back to the um, 1800s uh, airship mysteries. So mm-hmm. you, you mentioned uh, Samuel Tillman and Amos Dobor. So Colonel Samuel Tillman and, and Amos Dobor, they talk about the 1890s airship mysteries, is that correct? And and they provide some kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, witness testimony of it. Is that correct? Well, no, they, in, 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 these are two gentlemen who are, who really live. They're quite historical. They're in right. the historical record. Samuel Tillman, you can mm-hmm. find both of their photos online. And Samuel right. Tillman has uh, quite a biography as a U.S. Army officer. Okay. Um, he became, uh, for a time, he became commandant of West Point during the World War I era. He mm-hmm. was uh, essentially a scientist and engineer for the U.S. Mm. Army. Began okay. his career, you know, uh, after the Civil War. And here's the connection to the airship mystery is that one of the airships in the 1890s landed, I believe this was in Texas, one of the Texas landings. And um, the witness had a very friendly conversation with two men who mm-hmm. identified themselves and the, the witness claimed were um, Samuel Tillman and Amos Dolbear themselves. And, um, the, the interesting thing is when I first looked into Tillman and I write about this in origin, I discovered, mm-hmm. wait a minute, his background and his expertise uh, is right up the alley of the 1890s airship development. And he, if, if, you know, he was, he's definitely on the list of people that would have been involved with this kind of thing because he was a chemist he was a cartographer, but he was a chemist and in engineering and, 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 and the things that uh, would have contributed greatly to, the, you know, this mystery airship development, Samuel Tillman, you know, um, this was his expertise, he, or, you mm-hmm. know, um, among the things. And um, I, I think that, first of all, I, I'm... I do not think that this, the idea that this was an April Fool's hoax in newspapers is just, it's just more contrarian, uh, snark uh, nonsense. Uh, Because first of all, uh, the airship reports weren't just in April. (laughs) Right. um, Right. They started, I believe, in the fall of 18. 96 because Ambrose Beers had been in Washington DC and returned to San Francisco right before some of the first reports and this was around if I'm not mistaken it was around November of 1896 so so much for the April Fools thing but right. you know, the naysayers just you know you can't stop yeah. them. they do their own thing but um so I think there really was an airship mystery people were seeing these things so that said um uh, I, I do think that Tillman and Dolbear, Dolbear was a scientist, uh, mm-hmm. what, what we would today, uh, you know, uh, call, you know, he would probably have been an electrical engineer today, uh, mm. I, you know, uh, but um, these were real historical guys, and, and I think they somehow were really involved. Now, Tillman was, um, I believe, one of the founding members of the Cosmos Club. Mm. And, you know, I did a little research into that, but I got to tell you, Daniel List mm-hmm. has, has taken the deep dive into the Cosmos Club and, and 
carried that ball way down the field because listening to, I'm getting goosebumps saying that because <laughs> I really enjoyed his episodes where he revealed more about the Cosmos Club and their mm-hmm. connection to the hidden X. And uh, it just blew my mind. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, because I felt like, yeah. I knew there was and something that was out there. of New York. Is that right? The uh, Club. Yes. New York or Washington, D.C., New York, I think. And it predates the famous Explorers Club. But okay. um, he really, uh, if you want to know about it, this Cosmos Club and Samuel Tillman, um, mm-hmm. you know, what you read in my books is the basic. And, and Daniel has taken it, taken it really that ball farther down uh, the field, which um, I think further serves to further corroborate this witness report that Samuel Tillman literally was the guy he talked to on that airship. And um, uh, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. the airships were indeed um, uh, an American sourced phenomenon. Now here's the interesting connection to the Sonora Aero Club. There's also a, Within the 1890s airship mystery lore, very prominently are the the two gentlemen by the name of Wilson. Now, there was a Tosh Wilson who was Mm -hmm. in the Sonora Aero Club. And then there's the the I believe it's an uncle and a nephew, Willard Wilson and then uh, Hiram Wilson, who were uh, witnessed and in identified in the 1890s airship mystery. And what's interesting, too, is. Some of the technology described in the uh, airships of the 1890s is very similar to what the Sonora Aero Club was doing. So you're thinking, okay, even though the spelling is different by one letter, the Wilson, uh, the 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 Sonora Aero Club era of Wilson had two L's, mm-hmm. the Wilsons of the 1890s airship mystery, and after that is the one L spelling. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, uh, you got to look at that. You have Wilson, the Wilson family connection, and you have similar technologies, which I argue the 1890s airships were um, a progression of what the Sonora Aero Club was doing in the 1850s. What they were doing in the 1850s was like a proof of concept. So 40 years later, you would get what is described as the 1890s airships it, it's an advancement and i do this little chart called the bosley chart as yeah. you know it's in the book origin where i yeah. compare it to the development of the automobile the sonora aero club arrows aeros done in the 1850s would be equivalent to the ford model t and then the 1890s airships would be equivalent what, what they are to the sonora aero club's little devices is the same mm-hmm. thing that a 1958 buick would have been to a model t and then of course you get the modern you know, flying saucer, whatever, uh, bell can, I, I should have used the Kecksburg UFO. Now that I think about it, that would be like an 85 Porsche, what it is to the 1958 Buick. And I do that to show just the basic concept of here's a progression. See, mm-hmm. this is why I argue that there's no, in my opinion, the idea that the Nazis had some encounter with a crashed ET saucer and the ETs Mm -hmm. taught them this thing about the bell. I'm like, no, the problem with that is we have more evidence through Del Shao, through the 1890s airship mystery. We have more evidence that this is a very earthly human developed secret technology dating back to the 1850s. And Mm -hmm. that's why I show that progression. When you're talking about the bell, when you're getting into Kecksburg, what you're seeing is uh, essentially a hundred years of development of what the Sonora Aero Club was doing in the 1850s. And so, um, Walter, like, I also want to bring in, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up part one sure. and move on to, to part two. I'm, I'm uh-huh. super enjoying this conversation, so it's easy to lose track of time here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, if I recall correctly, and clearly I haven't recalled everything correctly, um, there, there's actually airship sightings, mostly in Texas, but in a number of places, uh, also in California, but oh, yeah. I've even read that there was some in like, I want to say in the Southern Hemisphere, like sure. uh, in South America, Australia, New Zealand, and um, that they're all in that same kind of time period, like a three yeah. to five year time period. D- do you have more information on that? And didn't one land in a town and then they actually had at least like the mayor come on board or something, or there was some kind of like the mayor of that town saw the 
vehicle and that was part of the report? Yeah, well, I, I believe one of the American incidents, the, the, the incidents in the United States were, were um, I, I accept, I think, in the case of one, mm-hmm. um, maybe two, the, the overwhelming, you know, 99% of them were in places west of the Mississippi. And mm-hmm. uh, right. uh, mostly from California, Northern California, and, and on through Utah, Colorado, and into Texas and such. Um, and uh, in my research, I was able to find a, a couple of airship sightings uh, very... Um, vaguely described and reported not much there in south america i didn't get into anything that was cited in australia and new zealand uh but since i did my research and writing on that several a few people have given me several interesting leads that i need to follow up on that involve a russian airship mystery in other parts of the world which might um lead me into the australian and new zealand stuff but uh, yeah most of them were definitely uh reported between san francisco and texas and that area in between and um i suspect as i lay out and write in um secret missions three the ambrose beers book which came out about six months or so after i released origin so it's not in origin um i hadn't developed the the hypothesis or the evidence uh, by origin, you know, mm-hmm. but in the Beers book is where I propose my hypothesis that the airship mystery, at least the United States portion, was the result of secret classified airship development begun by the United States after the civil war and i and i Mm -hmm. hypothesize that tied to the solomon andrews story yeah andrews is the guy who demonstrated uh, a controlled flight airship to members of lincoln's war cabinet during the civil war and newspaper reporters in dc it was it was in a report and we're told we you know we're told that uh they blew him off because you know, Edwin Stanton, the war secretary said, oh, we're in the middle of a war and this isn't going to help us at all, blah, blah, blah. And then nothing happened with it. I propose, I could be wrong. I propose that, yeah, maybe at the time they couldn't develop it, but I think after the war, they picked it up and that's where yeah. Samuel Tillman comes in. And I think he was part of representing the government side, the military involvement in this. It was probably America's first black project or could have been. And mm-hmm. it, I think as a young officer, he was involved in developing this technology so that by the time we get to the 1890s, what we really might be seeing is um, specifically 30 years of development of um, uh, America's first black project um, you know, dealing with controlled flight in these airships using the principles that, you know, Solomon Andrews, you know, developed that were similar to the Sonora Aero Club, or maybe he learned from the Sonora Aero Club members. Right, I, because weren't there, there were several little pods that it, it's the Prussians actually, because this is pre um, Oregon, the state I'm in is actually one year older than the modern state of Germany, which is kind of is mm-hmm. Germany prior to that. Uh, yeah. was just a bunch of little fiefdoms and duchies and yeah. like uh, city states and this whole hodgepodge but it was held together by the common language and then there was the Prussian unification sure. um, but uh, it was all under the NIMSA was this Prussian organization of Prussian nationalists it seemed prior to the unification of Germany but it was people who wanted to move towards that and we're going to yeah. go a little bit more into the roots of that Mm-hmm. in uh in in the second part but there were many different little like kind of uh, franchises almost yes. of this nimza project it's just that it seems and we don't have any evidence we don't have our del show of those other groups it's been kept hidden or lost right. to time or who knows what but there were other little pods out there so sure. to speak and so solomon andrus could have been in touch with one of them or even the sonora arrow club is that accurate I think so. I, I, I it, it, it's an accurate hypothesis. Yes. Yeah. And, right, um, right. Right. And, and we'll also discuss. Uh, by the time we get to the 1890s, there's another guy that could also have been associated with one of these little Keely. pods. 
Um, and that's Keeley, yeah. Yeah. John W. Keeley. So. And, and, and that story is particularly fascinating. He had some kind of craft that had like, I want to say a keyboard or some kind of thing where he would do different tones and it was some resonance and uh, sound based. Yeah, that's what, that's what he was working Acoustic. with. And what's interesting is, and, and we'll talk about this in that next hour, in the 1890s airship mystery, there is the witness account, or there are witness accounts, multiple ones, mm -hmm. of um, what the, the only way they could describe it was musical tones. And, yeah, and, and actual music present, you know, and and that's yes, exactly. That's right up the alley of what Keeley had been working on since I believe the time of uh, the post Civil War era. You know, if and, not and what era time. is Keeley in? I know he's in the 1800s, and I know he's around the Civil War directly after. Is right? He, yeah, right. he he. I think he really. Uh, uh, I don't have the book handy, but I want to say the 1870s when he was a younger mm -hmm. man is when he really dove into, mm -hmm. you know, what he was then developing by the 1890s. And then of course there was the alleged scandal, you know, that, uh, that there's always the accusation, Oh, you're faking it. And that kind of thing. Right. Like, it's funny how there's always scandals with these geniuses like Tesla and whoever, and it sure looks a lot like they're trying to put the lid on the person by right. you know, tightening the screws sure. on them. Yeah. And because they, the, the people are too valuable to kill, <laughs> but uh, they're too dangerous to allow to just, yeah. or, or it freely. would be, it would be too suspicious, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, you know, with some people, if they, they ended up dead, but that, and again, there you go. That's a whole other discussion in itself. Why are some people eliminated and others are not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's strange. And so let's see if there's one other thing I want to touch on in this section, then we'll probably move on to the next. Well, real quick. So the um, there's the whole um, Demonel family, and they ended up with some of these Del Shell drawings. So so now I forget the name of the gentleman who who found the drawings at a thrift store and the drawings had actually been miraculously rescued from like uh, an estate sale or someone was cleaning stuff out and someone came by and purchased them and then took the, them to a second hand shop if you want right, to share yeah, the, that piece the, the gentleman uh who owned the, the the shop it was an antique second hand and junk shop was a gentleman named fred washington and mm -hmm. he was the one that got possession of the del shaw books when they literally yeah it, it was it, there there was there was a house being cleared out um, and you know, the Dell Shell books were essentially going to be put in the trash. In fact, some oh. of them were Fred oh, Washington. It, it freaks me out to even hear those words. I know, yeah. right? <laughs> Fred, Fred Washington gets these and says, Oh, these are interesting. And he brings them to his shop. And then Pete Navarro, uh, um, the is the guy that really, we owe Saved all it. this to, um, he's the one that found the books in, uh, Fred Washington's shop. And at the time he bought as many as he could afford, and the, the, the Demon Ale Foundation ended up with several others. And they, of course, had a, an art gallery, which they had you know, sponsored for decades and certainly had back. This was 1971 when mm -hmm. Pete Navarro um, discovered Del Shao. And so it was after, after then that the Demon Ale Foundation eventually um, featured uh, an exhibit of Del Shao's art in their gallery and the interesting thing of course about the demon Hill foundation is that it's the demon Hill family and they turn up in the permindex uh jfk assassination milieu of garrison's investigation so you gotta wonder and and then keep in mind the airship mystery because of so many sightings and and witness accounts in texas is deeply connected to something going on in texas and of course, there's, you know, the JFK thing has the Texas milieu and on and so forth. So you got to wonder. And then I actually am looking at the demon Ills in my Napoleon research because the demon Ills are descendants of one of Napoleon's officers. You know, there's a Napoleonic connection between the demon Ills and, you know, um, of that day and the demon Ills that we're talking about. So you know, what the heck? It's a big what the heck. <laughs> so it's interesting. I'm just going to throw this tidbit out sure. there. Um, uh, in one of my shows, I interviewed um, Templar Grandmaster Timothy Hogan, and he talks about how uh, during the Napoleonic era, uh, they took the entire or the majority of the archives, the, the, the infamous Vatican archives, and moved them briefly to Paris 
And a lot of that, a lot of that material was copied before it was given back sure. to the Vatican. And that's interesting to me because again, that technology, things that were looted from yeah. ancient sources at the Library of Alexandria, um, uh, Constantinople and so forth, which we're going to talk about that more in part sure, two. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that is very interesting because it's funny how these same bloodlines, these same families, they just pop up a, a lot more than it seems statistically likely. Let's put oh, it yeah. that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, so yeah. I, and yeah, oh, go it's ahead. It's going to be interesting when we so, get into that. Yeah. So um, one, one last thing, what uh -huh. happened to those drawings at the um, at the Texas uh, uh, Museum? Like, are, have they gone missing or they? Oh, no, I, I think on the, display. I my understanding is the Demon Hill Foundation still owns several of them. But today, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the the guy to get in touch with is, is Stephen Romano of the Romano Gallery, because ah. he, he's the editor, um, uh, co-publisher, I think, but the, the editor who, who really put together this absolutely beautiful volume, just simply, I believe it's titled The Art of Delshaw. It's a mm -hmm. large format book with color plates of Delshaw's art. He generously gave me a complimentary copy of this for my research and it was in from his book looking at the the many 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 examples in that book that i discovered the the del shall the del shall bell drawing wow and, um steven has also has several pages of del shall's journal of course which are are in the book and uh, Stephen Romano is is one of the see uh, before guys like me before I started writing about Del Shaw and all that there there you know Pete Navarro discovered these but we owe a lot to Dennis Crenshaw to Theo Pyman to um, uh, uh, who was I just talking about Stephen uh -huh. Romano yeah. um, <laughs> you know yeah. and Tim Schwartz and and uh, you know these are the guys that have been talking about Del Shaw for years. Mm -hmm. And um, they're the ones that have uh, each one of them have carried the ball forward uh, mm -hmm. to the point that, you know, when I jumped in, you know, mm -hmm. at, at the, on the edge of the stage there and I've I've tried to carry the thread, you know, the threads that I have. And um, but Stephen Romano, that's if you really want to um, see a great collection of these things, his gallery has a lot. And I would recommend looking for that book. Fantastic. Well, to, to paraphrase Newton, if, uh, if Walter and I can see so far, it's because we stand on the shoulders of fellow, fellow weirdo giants yeah. who went deep on these obscure and esoteric subjects that I yeah. think, you know, a lot of the stuff that was super marginalized all throughout history at various times, 30, give it 30 or 40 years, 50 years, all of a sudden everybody knows about it. It's just well known. When I was a kid, was, almost nobody knew who Nikola Tesla was. Yeah. I did, but it was uh, weird and obscure information. Nobody knew. Now there's, of course, you know, Elon Musk and all that stuff, which sure. weirdly connects to some of this <laughs> secret space stuff with his own space program, Space X. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, the whole, <laughs> the, the weird thing with, um, Oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of his name like it's right there. Werner Von Braun's uh, yeah. one sci-fi novel to where the ruler of Mars is named yeah. Elon. That's just one of those things where, again, statistical yeah, anomalies how that abound. Yeah. Like, what are the odds? I've never heard of anyone named Elon except for Elon Musk and yeah. Werner Von Braun's uh, Emperor of Mars or whatever he was. So I think that that's a great place to wrap up part one. And in part two, sure. we're going to go back into actually um, Walter has an amazing, and this is actually the part of Walter's research that to me is even the more intriguing than what we have talked about here. I mean, you need it all kind of to flesh it out, but Walter has found a thread that explains where this technology could have originated in actually antediluvian times. A lot of times in this channel, I like to talk about the, the ice age or, or pre-flood civilizations that there's a lot of uh, secondhand information in the form of myth and legend that speak of uh, Atlantis or the Empire of Rama. Um, there's various different names for it, but a prior uh, civilization that had some degree of high technology that seems to be 
uh, if not global, it was uh, stretched a, a, across a huge section of the earth. There may have even been competing empires because the empire of Rama, which are uh, mm-hmm. talked about in some of the Vedic texts, may or may not be the same civilization as Atlantis. But regardless, there's enough uh, circumstantial evidence, especially with the things we talked about with like machining, like some of the pink or rose granite that has incredible machining in Egypt to where there's just there's no way they did that with copper tools, like get out of here, right. that's trash. Mm-hmm. And some of the megalithic structures in Baalbek and Lebanon and so forth and so on, there's just, there's no reasonable explanation for it. And I am always of the opinion, like Walter, that uh, a terrestrial source, meaning human, is infinitely more likely than uh, aliens. Although we will talk a bit about the possibility of extraterrestrial, sure. extraterrestrials in part two. And so... Thank you so much. And I'm going to have all of Walter's information. Um, Read his books. Incredible stuff. Watch his uh, watch his channel. He has it. You have a weekly show. Is that right, Walter? Yeah, I do a live stream uh, every Sunday. Very casual approach. Um, But I also do recorded um, content that I upload at the Walter Bosley channel, you know, little research reports. And and I just did my first official um, uh, guest you know, discussion mm-hmm. with um, a Jungian scholar named Laura London. I uh, saw that. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, yeah. but I saw that on your Facebook page. But I'll have all of Walter's information out at the bottom, and I'm also going to put in some more visuals throughout this uh, and the, the post-editing. So thank you so much again, Walter. And then uh, yeah. viewers will come back for part two. I'll probably be uploading in about a week after this one gets uploaded. And uh, Walter, for us, though, will be getting right back on it. So we'll just take a short break here. Yeah. So uh, thanks again. And if you got this far, um, if you want to hit like and subscribe for more content like this. Um, and there's going to be a lot more uh, excellent stuff in the future, including part two to this interview. Oh, yes, Walter. I just want to throw in that if you're interested in my books, the only place to get them is print on demand through lulu.com. Um, I don't sell my books at Amazon because I'm a and, small press publisher. And they're very, they're actually very high quality. I mean, this is a really nice book. It's got, it's even got color drawings uh, in a couple of places. Like here, there's the color plates. It's just, it's a very high quality uh, a book. I mean, um, some people think print on demand stuff isn't as good a quality. It's not true. It's, um, it's great. And for small publishers like Walter, that way he doesn't have to deal with people telling him what he can and can't put in his books and exactly. when he can publish it and all that nonsense. Lulu is a printer distributor for me. I'm, I and my label, my company, am the publisher. But uh, Lulu, and it's worth waiting because they are good quality books. You, you know, it takes you about 10 days to get your book, but it's worth Yeah, waiting. I got it very quickly, actually. I, I've had this book for about um, two or three years now, yeah. something like that. And um, so, yeah. So come back for part two. It'll be uploaded uh, in about a week. And so, yeah, it just hit like and subscribe and tap that bell. And thank you so much for watching.